This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I am your host, Steve Gould. Thank you for joining me. Um, it's been a little bit. I took a little bit of a break. Uh, just the way it goes. I, I started, um, if you're new to the podcast, um, if you don't know, I am in law enforcement. I'd taken a break and I'm, I'm back into it now. I'm an active police officer, so... The schedule's kind of kind of crazy, and I kind of have to take overtime and road work and stuff when it comes in. So scheduling with people can be kind of sticky, can be kind of tricky. Things get canceled, so there's been kind of a gap. A lot's been going on here. I have a little homestead. I have the dairy goats. I have the chickens, meat birds. I killed my first four chickens the other day, which was crazy and awesome and weird and <laughs> all those things. So, um, um. Yeah, well, I'm back. I'm back now, and I have a fantastic guest. This is episode number 77. Um, in the interim, between these episodes, uh, I got a, a sponsor for the next few episodes, uh, Burley Boards. It's at Burley Boards on uh, Instagram, at Burley, at Burley underscore Boards. And uh, this guy contacted me. The owner's name is Dan. He said he's a huge fan of the show huge fan of law enforcement. And he contacted me a couple months ago and he's like, you know, I'd like, I'd love to do something for the show. Um, love to make something for you. And it sounded awesome, but I didn't know what I wanted or what to do. And I said, Hey, that's awesome, man. Let me, um, let me think about it. And I felt, you know, I felt kind of bad putting the guy to work, you know, but he just really wanted to show his appreciation for, for the show and for, for law enforcement. So I ended up getting back to him and he makes like countertops, cutting boards, custom wood pieces, all kinds of awesome stuff. And I said, you know, what about like a big, like cut out of Massachusetts with the blue line through it? And he's like, absolutely, no problem. So Dan makes a thing, he sends it to me and it never gets here. He calls me like a couple weeks later and he's like, hey, did, did it show up? Because the tracking is like dead ended. I'm like, no, I never got it, man. And he's like, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. So he calls FedEx. They lost it. <laughs> he made this thing. Went to all this trouble to make this thing for me, and he lost, and they lost it. So let me put up a picture of a big dumb idiot holding it. There, there's. If you're on the YouTube channel, or you can go to the um, Facebook page, I put it up there too. Um, there's me holding the piece. It's Massachusetts. It's beautiful. It's black with a blue line through it. Um, just a really cool uh, wooden cutout. I want to figure out a way to get it on the wall here. And let me let me give him up here. Here's his Instagram. Go follow him. And if you have a custom thing you want made out of wood, uh, Dan at Burley Boards is your man. It's B-U-R-L-Y underscore boards. So give him a follow and thank you, sir. I love it. I truly appreciate it. Got to figure some way to mount it back here. I got corrected on my American flag. Also recently, they're telling me that this is hanging the wrong way vertically. The star should be on the other side. But when I, I, I got to tell you, when I flip it around, um, all the stitchings on that side. So it's a very cheap flag. Uh, I don't know where it's made. I, I really hope it wasn't made in China. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look, but uh, it can only be hung that way. So um, I appreciate the the correction, but that's, that's just the way it is. I can't, with this flag anyways, that's the only way it can hang vertically. Otherwise it will be real ugly. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking with the podcast, I might start doing seasons because of how hard it is to pump them out um, regularly, but just be patient with me. If you're a new listener, there's a backlog of 76 interviews behind this one. Um, I take a lot of pride in compiling them. I don't have any, I don't take any credit for them because it's just the, the men and women of law enforcement that provide crazy real life stories. Um, and people love them. People start listening and I get, I get emails all the time where they say, Steve, I started and I just binge listen to every single one. And then before you know it, they're on my case because I haven't <laughs> produced enough. They want more of these stories from these um, guys and gals and law enforcement. So um, enjoy the back library. Know that I'm working on them. I have a bunch scheduled uh, coming up. I had my guest right now. His name is Mark Kelly. Um, I'm really lucky to get this guy. He worked for East Hartford, Connecticut Police Department for many, many years. Started in 1991. He did patrol. He did vice he did narcotics. He was on their emergency response team, which is equivalent, their equivalent to SWAT. And he was also on a federal drug task force, which sounds a lot like Axel Foley from Beverly Hills um, 
cop too. So we'll have to ask him about that. Um, and he's actually, he's written a book. It's called Front Row Seat. If you look it up on Amazon, it is actually crushing. It's doing really good. It's got five stars. It gets uh, really good reviews. And I'm told this is um, not so much a crime novel, but a, cr- a cop story. Because this this book was written um, with his knowledge of all these years of law enforcement. So it's, it's very accurate and uh, just super entertaining. So I'm very happy to have Mark Andrew Kelly on the show. Let me bring him on now. Mark, welcome to Things Please See. Thanks for coming on, brother. Uh, I'm sorry, buddy. There we go. I unmuted you. Thank you for coming on, my man. Oh, okay. Good, yeah. <laughs> glad to be here. Very glad to be here. Excellent. So, um, authoring a book after police work, is that is that something you always wanted to do? Or have you always been a creative writer? Or is this just something like you had so many insane experiences, you said, I got to get these out? Um, no, nah, the only creative writing I ever did was on arrest warrants or search warrants. Um, that's a joke to, to any, pro, any, any prosecutor, defense attorney out there. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the, um, number of years ago, I've been retired now for nine years. And, um, the more, uh, videos come out of, uh, police encounters with, uh, citizens, of course, that reached, uh, Apogee last spring, um, friends of mine where they know me very well or they don't or relatives they say you know why do cops do what they do and i said well i can explain it to you real quick over a cup of coffee or a couple of beers but i can't really get you into the training we do why we act the way that we do um because you're not there you know and as much as i can go see a, a football game or baseball game and describe it but you're not the guy on the field or the girl on the field so right. it's uh I try to write the book so that you, the um, <clears throat> the reader, is there, uh, kind of riding along with the uh, the characters and the characters. Um, the three main characters are a brand new rookie, female rookie, uh, her field training officer FTO, who's about 10, 11 years on a job and looking to get promoted, and then uh, an old sergeant um, who's got 20 some odd years on a job is going to retire in the next 90 days and counting down his time. Um, so it kind of gives uh, my experiences um, <clears throat> through my 21 years uh, through those characters what I did. And it's mostly uh, not so much investigative work, but uh, how patrol works, how patrol reacts, um, what they see, what, what any given day can, can be like. That's awesome. I love that. That's so cool. I love that you hit, you're giving all the details of patrol because that... That is super interesting. Uh, usually, you know, a lot of a lot of things they go for the big investigations, the murders, and all that, and that's been done like so much in Hollywood and everywhere else. But um, the nuances of patrol and how how PDs operate is largely a mystery to a lot of even just communities. Like I work for a small community, and even to a small community, the police department's kind of like this clandestine operation. They're like, what are they doing? Like, what what's their why? Like, why do they do what they do? Why do they act the way they act? Like you were saying. And, um, so this book sounds fascinating and, you know, I have, when someone asks you that question, when they go, when they ask you, why do you do it that way? Or why did they react that way? And you know, to answer it appropriately, you're going to have to, you're going to have to have so they're going to have to absorb so much information to really get the right answer to understand why someone reacts in the moment like they would as a police officer. It's very frustrating for police officers to, cause it, it's impossible to, to do without without looking crazy like let me stand on my soapbox for three hours when i explain to you this right and um <clears throat> one of the first times my uh my older brother um intelligent guy you know very worldly and uh i believe the video he was referencing goes back a number of years but two patrol officers were sent out to a guy um selling contraband out of his trunk um he was a large male turned out he was armed one officer um, physically engages the suspect, and then the suspect, um, he starts to disarm the officer or gets his own gun out. The second officer shoots the suspect dead. And uh, my brother's like, you know, well, why don't they try to put a chokehold on? Why don't they try and do this? And I go, do you look at these guys? You know, the guy's like in their 40s, and the, the guy they're trying to wrestle with is a monster. Right. If that was your best friend, Steve, your best friend Steve wrestling with this guy, and the bad guy's going for his gun, you're just going to sit there and wrestle with him? I mean, it's... You can't go, oh, please don't do that or, or whatever. You know, the, right. the, the trigger is tripped. You know, the, the, the switch is tripped. You got to go full on. 
And um, part of my background is defensive tactics. I went through several different courses to be instructor for my um, PD. <clears throat> and trying to, uh, you know, some of you honestly say are people who want to be cops or new cops. And um, a lot of times I would get these uh, newer, you know, gung-ho, fresh out of the academy officers for a couple of weeks of in-house training. And um, I would say, I know you did defensive tactics at the academy. I'm going to give you a little step up on that. It's going to be a little more fiscal maybe. And maybe we're surprised because you didn't get punched in the face. You know, when has anybody here ever been punched in the face before? And to a person, none of them. Said, When's the last time you got in a fight? And I'm in a fight with your sister back when you were six years old. I'm in a real knockdown, drag out fight. That's right. the result. And, um, you know, my background in, uh, in the Marine Corps is like every other weekend in, in, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, we're getting bar fights. But most of these kids nowadays don't get in bar fights and they don't. And they had to get physical with somebody and most and to you know this our culture's credit um most people don't have to which is good but uh i try to relate to them you know it's only one or two percent of all the calls you go on where it's going to be physical but you have to win there's no there's no second place you have to win so it's one or two percent of the calls it's pretty much across the nation only one or two percent of calls you know get physical or violent um and uh, it's kind of, you know, a wake-up call. So, you know, we, we, we pad up, we do some wrestling. Um, we had this one exercise uh, called Fight for Life. And um, I would be in a, a total padded suit, and the, the trainees would have to punch me, hit me, kick me, baton me, all out, full strength, no, no sparring, no parrying. It was like full on for a full 60 seconds. Um, and then handcuff me. Exhausting. And uh, to it. To a, to a person, by about 30 seconds, they're gassed. Sure. And I start yelling at them. I'm not tired yet. I'm high on crack. I'm bigger than you. I'm going to pound you into the dirt. I'm going to take your gum belt. And they got, you know, they got to keep on fighting for 30 seconds till the bell rings, and then they get me in handcuffs. Um, and to, to a person, they were all like, wow, because usually I was a few years older than them, and they're like, they're gassed. And these are kids who were, some of them were, you know, amateur uh, boxers or wrestlers or, or that kind of thing. And it's like, they're, you know, you, you can pace yourself in that kind of an engagement. Um, if you're a runner, it's a different kind of thing to go full on for 60 seconds. Um, and I, I picked 60 seconds because in our town, it's uh, three by five square miles. And I figured if your backup is a mile away, and has to go 60 miles an hour to get to you. It's going to be a minute by yourself. Yeah. So you have to, be, you, you have to, you know, do that. Um, and that's a different kind of condition. It's more of a mental conditioning than physical. It was combination, obviously. But you have to know that you're going to be very uncomfortable, and you have to keep on fighting through it. So, um, you know, trying to again back to the original start of the conversation, trying to get people to understand. Yeah, you know, cops don't want to have to get in that 60 second confrontation. They want quick lights out, done fast. Because most officers are not. Well, from my experience, you know, Steven Seagal or uh, you right. know uh, or Bruce Lee. You know, most. Most of them are, are raising families. Most, once you get into your 40s, you start growing a gut. Most are not going out benching 320 pounds or doing 10-second sprints. You know, they got a full life besides a PD, and you're just not going to get in that kind of a contest with somebody who's 18, 19, 25 years old and probably under the influence of some sort of pain-deadening uh, narcotics. So, yeah. Um, again, people don't, don't realize that either. You can hit somebody as hard as you want. You know, full baseball swing the baton to the thigh. They don't feel it. You know, been there. It's it's so you know you gotta tell people it's, it's not what we see in the movies. It's nothing we see in the movies. It's not what we see on TV. It's even different than what we see on the shows like Cops. Um, it's you're there. It's your bruises. It's you, you want to finish your shift every day, and you want your your uh, your coworkers to you know, finish their shift as well. So um, to try and get that mentality to make people understand that. Uh, they kind of go, yeah, okay, okay, but you know, why the cop have to get the extra punch in there? I go, well, again, you haven't, you haven't been in a fight, right? You know, the, the adrenaline's rolling. You know, to, to flip that switch off is, is a discipline. And uh, most of these people who are sitting around talking about the cops should this, should not do that. It's like, well, tell you what, um, say I'm 60 years old. I'll get in a ring with you for 60 seconds, and we'll just knock the crap out of each other. And see how you feel when I keep on going, and you can't. And you know, you yeah. get thirty seconds, want to stop, and I keep on going, and see how you feel about you know the cops shouldn't, uh, you know, should have a automatic switch to turn things off real quick. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard. It's it's that's tough. It's I mean, a lot has changed. I mean, even since I got into um, law enforcement in the early two thousands, like I remember, I used to work with a guy who said, um, 
was a year or two older than me, but his dad and my dad both were cops in the 70s and 80s. And I feel like these guys used to fight all the time. And th- his dad would always say, I can't wait to, you know, he's kind of a hard ass, but he said, I can't wait till you get your ass kicked for the first time, you know, Tell, talking to his son. And um, yeah. it never really happened. You know, it just, I, I feel like it's just like it, it was like there was enough police now and there wasn't, it just seems like the advent of like the big bar fights and like the, the, um, and that maybe it's changing now, you know, in the cities, but it just didn't like, he, he never, we never really got our asses kicked or no one, it was never really a one-on-one thing. It was always kind of like, uh, you know, you're there with backup and then you kind of give each other a look and you're like, and then everybody's pig piles. You know what I mean? You just feel like, let's end it. Like you said, let's end it quick. Boom. Get on top of them and get them, get them packaged up. Yeah. It's, uh, again, getting back to, you know, civilians understanding, um, you know, you some of you list of questions, you know, you know, bizarre calls. It's like going for the mental roll of decks, pretty thick on bizarre calls. And again, you always remember the, uh, the ones that excited you. It's not typical of your day, maybe, but, um, it is noted in my book, uh, but this one character, uh, did six months in a uh, local jail, came out jacked up, uh, loved his brandy, loved his Coke. And he was sole purpose one night was to tear apart the, the neighborhood bar. And I'm about half a block away doing paperwork and I hear the whole thing spill out into the street. So I roll a cruise in the middle of the fight there or grab this one particular individual. He's cooperating. We knew each other from previous encounters. He had always cooperated with me. Um, and then he picks me up. And I wave out, you know, full uniform, all about 190 pounds. Pick me up like a doll and slam me to the ground. Ooh. And because uh, at times, you know, detention. It wasn't like who's going to get arrested. It's like, you, know, you stand over here, you stand over there. Backup's on the way. We'll figure out. What a betrayal of your yeah. past uh, um, and, rapport. Well, yeah, exactly. And uh, so anyways, um, somebody in the bar calls dispatch and says, yeah, your cop's getting his ass kicked out here. And so there were already cops on the way, and then that got everybody coming. And, oh, yeah. Um, the, uh, my, uh, my opponent um, was very, very jacked up, but he couldn't run. So he ran about uh, 100 yards down the road, middle of the road, uh, four-lane road, and then uh, ran out of gas. So I caught up to him and tried to tackle him. I couldn't move him. And then um, the backup got there, and we stood in the middle of this road, um, and we got tired. We were, we were taking – um, pinata swings at this guy with our PR 24s, hammering him. All, all the green areas that you know, you're trained to do, hammering him. Terrifying. We tired. The cops are getting out of breath. Oh my gosh. He, he just stood there like a statue and didn't didn't move. Wow. Um, and then somebody had the bright idea to back up one of the cruisers aside of him and flip open the door. And the guy got in from the opposite side of the cruiser from where the my opponent was. Grabbed him by the belt, and then while well, everybody else is doing haymakers out, I took a fly kick, hit him in the gut, bent him enough in half, and stuffed him inside the cruiser. Slam the door <laughs> shut. Oh my gosh. Go, go, go screaming, you know, go screaming to the, the PD. And this was shortly after uh, shift change. So he's not, cu- he's not cuffed. He's just, he's just like jammed into the back. He's not cuffed. And <laughs> at that time, this is back in the uh, early 90s, uh, you know, it was a big square Ford LTD police interceptors. Yeah. Uh, plenty of room. We, we, did not, we did not have. We did not have bars on the windows, and he's kicking out the window. We're just waiting for him to smash out between the two blocks from the, the fight happened to the uh, the PD. And so um, we finally get to the PD, and there's the evening shift leftovers there, and they're jacked up, ready to go. And this guy's not handcuffed yet, and you know took a swarm to get him. And at that time, the PD was very old. It was through a back door, up some stairs, past the stairwell, into the cell block, and the old uh, you know Mayberry uh, build, you know bar type cells oh yeah box, so yep and got him in there and um you know i was worried it was my arrest and uh one cop got injured in the fight on the street and uh i'm like well you know before i got off shift and uh four seven o'clock i got booked this guy and I'm pretty worried about it. so it was me and a couple other guys you know we take him out of the cell and the coke was worn off the alcohol had worn off and he was docile as a child and um he said uh you know, you're, I know what I, I know what I did. And he actually gave me some kind of failed compliment for actually catching up to him and, and catching him. He had no intention of, of giving up. Sure. Um, but you know, we got him booked on that. And then, uh, the, the same character a few months later, got into another 
fight. It wasn't my call, but whenever he was arrested, it was always a two or three officer escort into the building, into booking, into the cell block, just to ready to jump on if he went, went nuts again. And um, there's an example where people say, well, a person's handcuffed, he's helpless. Uh, and quite the opposite. Um, again, this guy was about six, about my size, you know, six feet tall, beefier. And I handcuffed, and the arresting officer in front of me asked him down the cell block to put him in a cell. And the suspect turned turned his head towards the officer's ear and came within a fraction of biting his ear off. Yikes. So if you're handcuffed, you are not defenseless. Yeah. And I've also seen handcuffed people run like gazelles through uh, city streets. So, um, you know, there was a little little thing to cell block then, too. And uh, the cop turned around and he goes, see anything i didn't see a damn thing but you know th these these are the, the, the little things that go on and and once that incident happened to me it happened i had like two or three years on a job um we did not have pepper spray uh tasers had not been invented yet and uh shortly after that we got pepper spray and when tasers came around i was trained in taser and then trained our officers in taser use um but even those aren't you know it's not they don't always work you know um, yeah they're like 50 percent, right and, on oh, what the taser or yeah no, i mean when i got trained in taser i thought the instructor told me there was like a 50 percent fail rate uh quite possibly yeah something like it's that been, you know it's probably been 15, 15 20 years now since i i was trained in it but um it was quite a shock you know I, you, to be a trainer you have to be shocked a few times it's like well that's you know that will knock you to your knees pretty quick um but I have seen where they fail only because it takes two prongs to complete the electric circuit. If one prong bounces off the ground, it's not getting engaged in a person's clothing or skin, then uh, it's 100% ineffective. Yeah, I so, one of our guys shot a guy in a, like a big puffy down coat in the winter. And he was right. like, he's like, ow, what are you doing to me? What are you doing to me? <laughs> like he's, it's like it felt like bees were in there, but it wasn't, you know, he wasn't getting that neural lock. He was just getting like the, yeah. like the little sparks all over his skin. Yeah, well, yeah, there's always a, I won't name the officer, but he went to tase somebody that was starting to run away, and one of the taser barbs got caught in the guy's clothing, the other one didn't. But the barb got caught in his clothing very well, and the officer didn't have a good grip on his taser, so it fell out of his hand, so the suspect was sprinting down the street with the taser <laughs> bouncing behind him all the way. So it's like, yeah, go, go write that one up. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, man. Yeah, those. I mean, when they do work, though, we had a guy who um, he turned, it was a domestic and he was in a parking lot near the home and he turned and was going to run back there. And this is a violent guy that um, known to us, bad dude. And he got tasered in the back and it was just lock and then in the tar, you know, just yeah. by, mo by morning in the cell, there was like that rotten almond smell you know, from all of his wounds healing on his face. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you know, basically like, what happened to me? We're like, uh, you know. You were bad, and then you got. Well, yeah, we we had the taser. We we I was trained the taser, and um, we had not trained the department yet. So we had a couple uh, in the locker in the watch commander's office, and um, again in our old building, the old cell block. Uh, this one arrestee was defecating in his hands and then throwing a feces up and down the cell block, and there were other <laughs> prisoners there as well. And it's uh. a weekend, yeah, you know, a weekend night, you know. Friday, yep. Saturday night. And so Wonderful. Yeah, the, the Washington Commander Sarge, a very good friend of mine. Um, we're trying to mull over our options. What, what can we do with this guy? Because he's, you know, it's now becoming a hazmat situation. We have other prisoners and uh, ourselves in this area. Sure. What we're going to do. <clears throat> and um, I said, well, you know, is there, you know, a taser in a locker? So I'm qualified to use it. If you want, you know, you're, you're the sergeant, but if you want to, I'll, I'll use a taser. Um, we'll find some Tyvek suits to put on. And uh, we'll do Ugh. a cell block and tase them and take them out and put them in a pad cell. Yikes. And so uh, so we do that. We get all suited up. I got the taser. Um, get the typical warnings, you know, through the bar, you know, back up, see your hands, stop throwing shit around. And uh, he was like, you know, the first part of the F came out. And it's like, yep, okay, he's not cooperating. Hit it with the taser. He went down like a stone. And, you know, that, that click, 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 click that the taser gives. And he, mm. he was like, you know, just on the ground and then he was moaning and you know you open the door bum rushed him hooked him up 
through in the in the, uh, in the padded cell. And the other prisoners didn't know because you know the taser makes a little bit of a pop when you shoot it. Yeah. The other prisoners are like curled up in the corners of their bunks, just like knees to their chest, going, "We don't know what happened to that guy, but we are no part of any of this shit these cops are doing." You know, they they was like they want nothing. There was no phone calls, no complaints. The wall. It was like we were like backing up out of this thing because they effed that dude up bad. Load, you know, carried him out of the, the cell, <laughs> dragged him down the cell block, and threw him in. Covered in crap. They want nothing to do with that. Was a, but that, that was the first time we used it. And uh, I think it's one of the first times on duty in the, the state of Connecticut. Um, and uh, it was, you know, it was very effective. And shortly after that, you know, the general order has to come out and then we started training everybody else. And, um, yeah. you know, it is it is a good tool because uh, not everybody, not not all cops are, um, are fighters. I mean, some of the best cops I know uh, are, they, they could you know, sell ice cream to an Eskimo. They, they can talk and conjole and get confessions and admissions and witness statements and they're great at that. But it's like, well, we got, you know, we got to wrestle this guy. It's like, well, they're not, they're not the guy to do that, you know, or the girl. Yeah. Guy. It's just that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, the, a lot of the guests that I have are, um, they really swear by or really advocate for jujitsu in academies. Just a ground game, you know, like just, teaching every trying to trying to instill that in cops like you should do some kind of hand-to-hand -hand stuff you know just to just to see like you said before like see what it's like to be at winded and out of breath and you know wrestling somebody um you know i played i'm not like a i was i've never been like a bar brawl or anything like you know, my college days or anything but i was i played sports i was rough and tumble kid never had problem wrestling people but i'm not i'm by no means like a you know good fighter i don't think i think i just put my head down and run you know and just muckle people if i can right yeah you know i don't mind trying but i definitely work you know i've worked with people that can actually fight that are like you know good fighters and that's um i love those guys standing behind you you know yeah no one of the guys uh he was a retired uh weathersfield connecticut pd um officer and uh he, he's very much into the the, uh, the fighting and the martial arts. And to look at him, it's like, yeah, he's average good shape. Uh, but he's so quick. Yeah. I mean, he'll, he'll do a leg sweep on you and have you upside down in a minute. He'll have you in an arm bar, an arm lock. He, has, he can twist you up in knots. And he was one of the instructors I had uh, for one of the classes I went through. It was like, you know, I can practice all day long and get good at it, but you'll never get to his level. He's one of those guys just don't want to. You almost want somebody to piss him off to the point where he goes nuts on him because you want to just watch him. <laughs> You know, push me in the ball, you know? Yeah. Chuck. But he's very cool. He's a very level-headed guy. Very, very good guy. He's like, you know, and those are the guys, that they never get that. They never go off, you know? They always know they can just, like, tear somebody apart, and they, they never really do. Right. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Mark, can you tell us about your first um, hot call you responded to as a young officer? First call to get your blood, boy, you know, going. Um, yeah, that was kind of, uh, I realized afterwards it was kind of a setup. Um, so I was on FTO, first phase FTO, and uh, call comes in, motorcycle crash in the highway, partial amputation. Uh, so I was like, oh, that could be, you know, whatever, you know, you're not quite sure what to expect, what you're going to see. Um, so license siren, get up on the highway, and I was a little oh, very, very much relieved and uh, a little surprised to see the paramedics were already there um, and uh, loading the crash victim onto a, a gurney, and I did see beyond the bike was, uh, you know, it looked like part of a pant leg and a boot. So that part was true. Mm. Um, but I found out later it was, uh, it was kind of one of those little tests. You don't know you're being tested until you do it. But one of the dispatchers and a dispatch fire as well, um, said, yeah, we knew it was going on up there. You want to send you up there to see how you handle it. And so I was like, well, okay. You know, I guess I handle it. Right. I didn't have to do anything, you know, right. if I was the first one there, that that's a little different. That you're the first one there. Yes. Um, and I, and uh, you know, I kind of cover that in the uh, in the book. Um, the uh, the rookie officer uh, has to handle a uh, handgun suicide, a large hell caliber handgun suicide, and she gets there moments after it happens. And um, again, you're so you're in a, a rural PD now, so getting back up from medical there fast is, is not really going to happen. And our PD, um, we're mandated uh, to have, have eight officers on the road and. Uh, all the fire department were um, medical qualified, so they handled medical calls. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those things where you get there, you, see, you, you know, you see the mess, 
you see the family's there, the victim's there, uh, and it's, it, uh, that was the first time I felt overwhelmed. Yeah. And was, it was two or three years on a job. And um, it was really like, geez, wow, that's just hard to process. Mm-hmm. And I can almost feel the, the gray coming out of the edge of my eyes. You know, don't, Mark, don't, don't pass out in front of the family here. That's yeah. Bad. That's a bad thing to do. So, uh, but you can feel it's just, you know, very overwhelming sight. Um, you're expected to do something. There's nothing on God's earth you could do. Yeah. Uh, so you're kind of going through the motions, you know. So I call on radio. It's like, yeah, expedite medical, move furniture out of the way so I get in here real quick. But anyways, you know, I got through the call, and um, I was fortunate that I did work with some great officers, other patrol officers who knew what I, what I had seen. And uh, they would check in with me every so often for the next few days, next couple of weeks, you know, how you doing. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's a great role for the, the senior guys and, and women to do to the, the newer people because, you um, Again, your audience that's going into this, you're going to walk into those scenes. You're going to be overwhelmed. You know, if you're there with a partner, you're the second one to arrive, you kind of hear the radio or know what's going on. When you walk into something like that the first time, it's like, you don't know what to do. Yeah. And it's like, just go through your training, you know, let it kick in and, and get it going. But um, it's funny, after that one scene, no matter what I saw after that, it never, never really bothered me. So, yeah. I guess lucky in that way, but you don't know. And that's why I kind of dress in the book, um, the book your office is talking to uh, a sergeant. She get, and uh, she goes, how do you know if you can handle it? And I, the sergeant says, well, you know, you know, you got to, you have to self analyze yourself or, or go to a professional or do something, but the job's not for you. If you can't handle that, you know, turn your badge and gun and go to something else. Cause you're going to have those calls every once in a while and you got to be able to deal with them. Yeah, that's that's such a great point, Mark, and it's such a fine line too between like when you're a young cop, and like you said, I had calls like that um, that were like exceptionally gory or sad or you know whatever, and you're just like there you you might come to a point where you're like I need I need to see if I can grow a callus to this or I can't. Like if it keeps hitting you like that um, over and over, then you might know like maybe this isn't for me. Like if I, if I keep feeling like that, like, cause I, you know, I went my own career, I went to a few calls I considered gnarly and, you know, um, I remember one, um, a guy, dead guy we worked on and I just bought a sandwich from him. I've mentioned it before in the podcast and I knew him. I'd never seen someone I knew dead, you know, like freshly dead, like on the floor of a restaurant. And, uh, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I was after the call, the sergeant's like, are you okay? I'm like, I feel I'm like, I was all cold sweats and stuff. And he's like, um, yeah. I go, I think I'm okay. And he goes, you look, uh, have you looked in the mirror? You, you look green. And I thought he was saying like, I look green, like new, but he's like, no, you yeah. look like, um, like white green. And I was like, oh, and I did. I looked like not well, you know? And, um, yeah. that call really made me think like, geez, Louise, this is real. <laughs> you know, this, that really got to you. Um, and it was for the next six months, I, I felt a little tingle every time like uh, rescue went off on our scanner, like for uh, someone down or someone or a bad accident. Right. Yeah, I felt a little anxiety like, ooh, am I going to be able to handle this? And, you know, ultimately I did and I was fine. But um, young officers, like you said, you'll have that time where you're like, you're going to figure out if um, you can power through that or not. Because being the first guy is really uh is really overwhelming it's really tough yeah and um there was a colleague of mine uh shortly after retired a year after retired uh he took his own life at the pd and um subsequently found out that uh is the, the accumulation of what he saw he's taking patrol his whole whole career uh in and out doing some inside um work once in a while but primarily patrol and um, it was just an accumulation. And uh, I read some uh, some book about veterans in Vietnam who had been World War II veterans, Korean veterans in, in Vietnam, and they couldn't take it anymore. And, you know, the author in that book said, you know, it, it's cumulative. All these things that you see and have to go through that are traumatic like that accumulate. Um, yeah. Where the combat veteran maybe rotated in and out to his theater, you know, for a year or six months. Uh, police officers every day go out not knowing is it going to be 
an easy day taking barking dogs and barking complaints, or it's going to be that that one was like it's a real mess, and it's going to be a you know, eighteen hours of dealing with it. Um, yeah. And uh, you, you don't know when you start, and I feel very fortunate. Um, I was able to get through it without uh, you know going cuckoo or anything. But again, my colleague, um, uh, it burned him. He took his own life, and um, yeah, that's something that is a, is a problem in our in our profession. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I worked at LAPD backgrounds with a lot of retired like legends. I consider them. <laughs> and um, one of them was an Englewood cop who was retired, and he was a Marine. And then he was an Englewood cop for years, and then he retired and came to LAPD backgrounds. And um, he said the thing about police work that got him was, like in the Marines, when he came home, it was over. It was like, I'm home. And... I can kind of recover. Um, the police thing never gave him rest. He would sit at dinner with his family and think about, I got to go in tomorrow and it's back on. Like it never, he feel like he, it's like mentally you never get a break. Like you, you never get that. Um, a PTSD just accumulates and he felt like he never, you know, you never really get a break from it. It's kind of, you know, insane. Yeah. Again, fortunately, I didn't have that that issue, but uh, I know some. You know, some guys are pretty smart. They'll they'll uh, you know walk into the chief's office and they I need an inside job for a few couple of years. Right. And then they'll you know rotate through investigations, or whatever. But um, you know, you don't know what you can handle until you handle it. Uh, I was a fairly new sergeant assigned to the bureau, and my uh, boss and very good friend, um, an older gentleman had died in a, in a house fire. Part of the garage had caught fire. Put the fire department put that out. They found him uh, already deceased. Shipped them to a uh, coroner's office. And he goes, yeah, Mark, the, uh, the post-mortem's tomorrow. You're going to it. I go, well, it's not my case. or my officer's case. You're going to it because you haven't been an autopsy rate, have you? I go, no. Oh, boy. Goes, you're going to an autopsy. Have fun. Oh. It's like, it's like <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't really want to have to do this. He goes, no, you're going. And uh, I was dreading it. And, yeah. um, I got, you know, I got through the whole thing fine. Once, once, once it started, um, I found it fascinating, which I wouldn't, yeah, I was, let see if I can get my whole career and not go on an autopsy, I'm doing great. Yeah, but, I agree. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I had to go this one here and I was actually, uh, amazed and, uh, the ME, um, I'm asking him questions like a newbie and he's very, very patient. And I said, you know, why? You know, they take the brain out and they, they slice it like a you know, very thin, like a meat slaver. You know, what are you looking for? Looking for any kind of cancer things or any issues with the brain. They did it, you know, the way they slice it, they test it, and they go, well, he died of smoke inhalation. And, uh, you know, she'll be, this is the guy's lungs. They go, those, those little freckles, that's all it took. Go, that's all it took. Little freckles on the lung narrow is what killed him. Wow. And uh, so, so the whole process, you know, I forget how long it takes, you know, a couple hours. And um, the... Uh, there's one part that that really kind of freaked me out because the body cavity is empty and the uh, assistant kind of reached inside the cavity from the inside, pulled the guy's nads out, sliced them off with a scalpel and weighed them. And I thought, oh, <laughs> and I was like, I bent over myself, you know, grabbed my own nuts. Like, wow, that, that's kind of brutal. But uh, <laughs> it's, you know, so I walked out of there. No go, bueno. I'm not quite sure what I just, what I just saw, what I just experienced. But again, anything after this is nothing. You know, yeah. and, um, I think that's, I think that's why, um, you know, people say, you know, why do you want to be a cop or anything? I did not grow up wanting to be a cop, but it's, um, it's the excitement is, it's kind of the stuff on the edge that most people don't see. Yeah. Um, and experiencing that. And that's, uh, and to me, that was the, the, the reason why, uh, you know, I did it and, um, you know, for the most part enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's a, you got, you got to like it. If you don't like it, it's a, a long Long life, because <laughs> long and painful. Weekends, it's, yeah. it, it can be, yeah, it can be difficult. So you know, you got to enjoy it. You got to tolerate the politics. But um, if you like working the street and uh, dealing with people, it's uh, it's phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. My my buddy, my made detective, and they said um, he went to like the whatever the state certified class to be. I don't think you have to go, but it's like you know, like the sergeant's class kind of thing. Like they want you to go to yeah. this class and he went and um, part of it was an autopsy and the the ME came in and he said, um, listen, it's kind of a special scenario. You guys can opt out of this if you want because the only 
usually we have a few on the on the um, docket, but the only one we have today is a seven year old kid. And uh, all the yeah. detectives were like, Ugh. "Like this is going to be our first, you know." Yeah. Um, and he made it. He made it through it, but uh, he said a couple people were like, you know, got they, you know, the walls closing in. They were kind of like, "I think I should leave." Where's the door? Um, get a, yeah. go out, get some air. Yeah, that's- um, but yeah, I thought that was, that gave me a little anxiety. I'm like, I don't know if I want to make detective, man. I don't want to do that. <laughs> that sounds awful. Yeah, no, that's, well, that's, you know, that's what we deal with. And that's what the odd thing is always found doing, uh, even if it was just a, a natural sudden death, is you're, you're walking to somebody's house and, um, you know, they got their, their whiteboard and their business cards and their, their calendar set up. You know, they plan on going through the rest of the day just like you do. And it's like, yep. nope, today's, you know, today's the last mark in that calendar and, and you're done. So to me, it's always that, you know, it's, you know, you're living life, loving life. But <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you're watching that again, uh, kind of what front row, you're, you're front row seat seeing all the, all the stuff that nobody else yep. sees there, and you see it over and over again. There's, there's no shortage of events being a police officer to make you feel grateful for what you have. Yeah. I've, so many times I've gone home on a holiday or something and looked at my family and been like, ah. I'm the luckiest man in the world. You know what I mean? Because you just went to something terrible, somebody else's life, you just walked right into it. Um, and you know how it is. You walk in and you smell their cooking and you see what was happening and everything was normal until this one thing happened. And then right. all their lives are upside down and you're in the middle of it. You know these people, you know? And then um, you hang up your... My buddy, you know, you hang up your, your stuff and you go home for the day. And my buddy always had a good comment. Like he said... Um, He'd always say, like, if you ever feel weird, he said, just he said, just rest assured. He's like, this is not a normal job. This is not the normal job. He said, you don't you don't go to a normal job and put Kevlar on your body. Like he said, this isn't right. So if you ever feel like this isn't normal, it, it's not. This is not what other people do, you know, because uh, you can kind of forget that um, when you get sucked up in the police culture. So yeah, it's. Uh... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead. Just. I got an, I got another one for you here. I was going to say, um, did we answer your strangest or more bizarre or most bizarre call already, or no? Um, like I said, I got a I got a Rolodex for for those things. But uh, um, well, here's, wait, here's one where my partner, uh, twelve partner, you know, Ray and I, we it's uh, about this time of year, June morning, and um, sun's already up, working midnight, so it's like six o'clock on a Sunday morning. Uh, hoping that the last hour goes by and we can just uh, pack it in. Call comes in, domestic. It's in a uh, government housing unit. And uh, so we go there, and female half says he's in the bedroom. He's been doing coke all night. He's throwing shit around. Uh, you know, that's it. So my partner and I go into the, the bedroom, and we're now dealing with a, a paraplegic, no legs. Above, hmm. You know, above the above the knee amputation. It's like, well, okay. Yep. And he he is he's like lights in. My partner and I is like, you know, f you, get out of here. She, you know, he takes the lamp off the uh, nightstand, throws it at us. Anything that wasn't nailed down, started throwing at us. We're like, well, okay, that's it. You're you're going in. So it's like, you know, in the back of your mind, it was a paraplegic. Don't don't hurt him. Well, he hops off the bed. So now his shoulder height, his head height is now our crotch height. Oh, so you geez. know he's punching us. Oh yeah. Oh you're my like, hey, goodness! Dude, you'll knock it off, you know. <laughs> nice to you, you know. And he's like, he's like wailing our nuts, you know. I was like, you're like, knock it off. So I'm gonna have to kick this guy's ass. We went, yeah, so we so you know, Ray and I try to wrestle this guy. There's no legs to like, you know, do a, a leg lock or anything. He's like, well, how do we arm bar this guy? Because his arms aren't staying still. His arms are ten times stronger than ours. <laughs> it's like a spider monkey. And we, and, and we, yeah, we wrestled from the bedroom down the hall through the kitchen, out the little hallway of the the unit, and onto the front stoop of the apartment building. And oh my gosh, I hook him up, yeah. And then Ray and I, you know, Ray and I look at each other, like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> you know, this this guy's you know, like screaming bloody murder on the ground, he's all nicked yeah. up, you know, he's boxers, and and so you know, you'll call for a medical, and then we're gonna, you know, ship you to the hospital, hand cut up to the gurney, and we'll process you later. But it was well, as well as once you get done, it's like. What happened? We just got a fight with a paraplegic, and we almost lost. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man. Oh my goodness. I I mean I've I've fought some ladies before when I had the same thought where I'm like I'm I am fighting a lady 
and she's <laughs> she's really giving yeah. us run for her money. <laughs> but that's yeah, yeah. But, you know, you're you're mentally say you we should not you know punch that hard or right you know they're not as strong as you so go easy on it's like yeah that was that was the wrong move <laughs> yeah you get hammer fist in the face and you're like okay uh it's on <laughs> yeah yep yep that's crazy Great man choice. well i imagine when you're you know he's he's using his arms all the time he's probably incredibly strong and has a lot of stamina in his upper body you know it's yeah yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was like, you know, wrestling, you know, uh, pro wrestler from the waist up. <laughs> so that was kind of bizarre. That is crazy. That was one of the bizarre ones. Yeah. Mark, can you tell us, um, can you tell us about, like, one of your more intense or um, terrifying calls? Um, well, terrifying, uh well, one time I thought we were walking into a shootout. It didn't turn out that way, but um, it's also covered in the book. But one of our officers was, was killed on line of duty. And uh, being part of the ERT team, um, we were assembled pretty quickly. And then uh, some units thought there was a, an empty house nearby where the killing happened. And um, we all load up in the van, and we're going to sweep the house. And... Uh, the way the uh, raid team went, uh, my best friends with shotgun. He was always first. I was always second with a MP4, and on down the line. And so, back in my mind, I'm like, um, you know, Mark, don't don't dick this up. You know, we're, we're going. And this guy already killed one cop. You know, he's armed. You know, he's desperate. And we're Damn. we're going to that's stressful. Our, we're going to do our job right now. Sure. And everybody got in the van. Nobody backed down. Which I got, you know, give credit to all the guys. Said, nobody backed down. We're going to do this. And then uh, somebody was thinking they. Um, they, uh, somebody snagged a canine unit and had the canine unit sweep the house and the house was empty. Um, so, you know, van turned around, we went back to our staging area, but that was probably the, the one time of all the, all the drug raids, all the hot calls went on where it's like, this is, this is got in bad for somebody and it better be the bad guy, not me or one of my guys. And you're, the most thing that you don't want to do, you don't want to fail your, your, your teammates. It's not yeah. so much you get hurt, but you don't want to make a mistake with one of them get hurt. So, um. Yeah, that was one of the most intense. That whole episode again is covered in the book, but the the um, the, uh, the intensity of that moment was was something that uh, you don't forget. Yeah, really. Um, the ride there, the build up of that, and then like um, you know, having to bottle that and hold it all together, working as a team, um, dealing with the guy you know is capable and already did kill someone. Uh, that's that's about as intense as it gets in police work. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, so we got through that. Again, nothing, um, like a lot, of, a lot of police work, uh, the, uh, the prediction is worse than the actual call, so. But, uh. Yeah, I, I find that with, um, <laughs> sometimes I want to call dispatch and be like, uh, you could have, uh, you know, you could have put that information out differently. Like, <laughs> sometimes you get calls, like, that call you're talking about sounds righteously <laughs> intense, but. You know, you, you do get a lot of calls as a police officer that come in like, and it it really does dictate how you show up to it and, and your whole demeanor. Um, and, you know, the way it's put out can be real freaky. And then you get there quickly. And you, I hear it all the time because I'm through county dispatch, how quickly it de-escalates when the police get there, you know. But um, it comes in like, you know, uh like a mass shooting and then you get there and it's like, ah, it's verbal domestic. I'm going to clear. And it's like, what, what, how did this, yeah, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a pretty good relationship with our, as a sergeant, uh, supervisor of the squad, um, a good relationship with, uh, most of our dispatchers. And, um, after a, a hot call, a complicated call or whatever, um, because they are different union, different schedules, uh, we would get off our evening guys would get off the road by midnight and we had to hang around till 1230 and then go. Um, but the dispatchers, they were done by like 1130. And for us to have a debrief and include them, they'd have to can call a supervisor. Can we have overtime for, you know, the half hour, four, five minute debrief. And uh, there's always some squawking about that. And I always just say, you know, I don't really care. I'm in charge of squad. I'm in charge of dispatchers on this time of day, you know, will, which is not quite true, but, Everybody kind of bought it, and I, I signed their overtime slips and um, take the heat for it later. But to have the dispatchers uh, know what's going on 
and to hear their uh, hear the phone recordings, what they hear, what they dispatch, and then what we do, and to try and get a good coordinated effort. Um, because often the caller is uh, in disarray. They yes. may not know exactly where they are. Yes, Mark, let me uh, amend my help. statement because you're so right. It's not. It's actually because I've taken them. I'm. We're at a small enough PD now where I have taken the call and actually gone myself. And I've been like crapping yeah. myself <laughs> leaving before from the person on the phone. So these the dispatch, dispatch is getting frantic people almost adding or making stuff up. And when you get there, it's different. So that's true. Yeah. So, we, true. Try, so we try to coach. Yeah, they try and coach. Uh, this is what we heard. And... Sometimes you hear a recording, but this is what we heard. And that's why we said this to you guys. We're not making it up. We're not trying to get you guys amped up or, or right. overcompensate for what's going on. And so that's, um, we found that the debriefings to, to work quite well. And it also helps because sometimes there's animosity. You know, why'd you say this? Why'd you do this? And I go, well, that's, that's the best I had. That's, I'm trying to help, you know, the dispatcher side of it. And I say, well, it didn't help. It actually kind of made things worse. Um, so then, you know, then there's some animosity going back and forth on who was right or who was trying to do the better job. So by getting both sides of the, the team together and talking about it afterwards, especially, you know, a hot call where, you know, uh, an officer's injured or there's multiple casualties or whatever, it's, it's like, you know, let's, let's, let's really talk about this and debrief it because uh, yeah. what, what you said over the radio, we, we saw we got there were, were two different things. Um, and uh, that, that helps a great deal. And I don't know if, you know, again, anybody who's an administrator out there listen to this and you have the ability to have your dispatchers ride with your officers or uh, debrief after critical incidents with the officers, uh, you should. Um, because we had one call where uh, one of our officers um, was a bad domestic. Uh, an officer was shot. His canine was stabbed. He was shot through a domestic. A bad guy was shot. Uh, so a big mess. And I was just coming off, off shift. And um, so I was gathering paperwork. So there's already enough sergeants on the road. I went to dispatch and I coordinate them because I knew they were going to be very stressed out. And one dispatcher actually had to go, go to the lady's room, uh, get sick, and then come back in. And she did more. You know, her hands, her feet are shaking as she's, you know, oh wow, the microphone. Yeah. Because uh, um, they, they have no, they have nothing to do. They they hear what's going on. They hear the cops oh, I know. Help. They hear the the siren. You know, yes. the medics going. They know what hospital people are going to. Another guy said, you know, I got the dog. Where, you know, where's the vet, nearest vet to try and save the, the, the canine? All this stuff's going on, and they, they are on a, on a, they're very on edge. As they're oh. sitting there. They can't do anything. I know. They're part of it, but they Torture. can't think about it. Yeah. And that's the first time that I was in dispatch for something like that. And I said, holy shit, I feel so bad for these people. Yes. Um, and once it all kind of got squared away, I made a point to go back to them and, and debrief them as to what happened, how it happened, how, how things are going. Um, so again, one, one, one was very long nights. Uh, the bad guy was dead. The, the officer, the officer, and the dog both returned to duty after quite a bit of rehab. Um, but uh, that that was when I started thinking that we have to get the dispatchers into some of these debriefs on these calls, so they know what's going on, and to help them relieve their stress. Because a lot of times we get so wrapped up in the investigation, especially when an officer's injured, uh, we're so wrapped up in it, and then. We kind of, whatever, 12, 18 hours after and you, you go home and you're wrung out. Well, nobody ever told a dispatcher what, what happened. Nobody's going back and telling them what actually happened. Or oh, yeah. It's you know? so, so true. It's like, well, what happened? You know, they're trying to hold their breath for, for hours and they don't know what's going on. So, um, so if you're, yeah, if you're an administrator in charge of a, a dispatch unit or whatever, I would strongly encourage you to have your dispatchers uh, brief and debrief with uh, the officers on any kind of critical incident. Yeah, absolutely. I, wor I mean, my job now is like I'm often in awe of how how dispatch handles multiple multiple calls at once in high stress. There's pro it's it's a, it's like police work. Oh, they're, they're magic. A, they're, they're, it's crazy. They, yeah, I've seen I've seen some of these. I mean, uh, majority are female, and um, I don't know if it's a, a a gender thing, but. It's like watching a, a rock and roll pianist playing, you know, one hand's doing this thing, another hand's doing this thing, and they're talking on the mic, and they're tapping on two different screens and filling, you know, filling in blanks on the computer. It's like, wow, talk about multitasking. These, you know, these, these guys and women, you know, can do it. And, uh, well, somebody over their shoulder telling them, you know, what else is going on. So, right. um, yeah, my hat's off the dispatchers. Um, and our, and our PD, uh, they were kind of the redhead stepchild, always understaffed and, um, 
could always use more training. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the, the men and women dispatch are, are phenomenal. They, uh, they work hard. Absolutely. Yeah. There's always, um, there's always one that's, you know, the, like the, uh, the cranky one that no one likes that ruins their whole reputation. <laughs> you have that one that's oh, yeah, like, no. we, we have, we have <laughs> you know, you, you ask for anything, anything and they're like, ah, phone, you know? yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. I think it's the same everywhere, but yeah, you're right, man. They're, that job, I say, I tell them all the time when our dis, when our dispatch wasn't regional, when, when I worked at a bigger place that had, we had our own dispatch like you had, I would tell them like, I'd rather go to the call then take it and oh, then yeah. like, and then exactly. initi initiate the, the cards and the, the automated nine one, the, the, the CPR over the phone and not knowing what the hell's going on. And like you said, not getting answers like, Oh my gosh, it's, yeah. it's brutal, man. Absolutely brutal. So Mark, um, do you have a heartwarming situation encounter that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, many years ago, being brand new, uh, community outreach is back in the early 90s. Community outreach policing was the de rigueur thing to do to uh, reform police officers because they're, they're always trying to reform us, but not the, the criminals. Yeah, but we're the, back uh, there now. We're back at so, community uh, policing. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, uh, me and my good friend Todd, we're like, you guys can be uh, community outreach play, you know, officers in a, a uh, rundown part of town called Mayberry Village. So, um, we would, we'd, uh, get paid overtime on a grant overtime to walk the village and, uh, talk to the residents. And, um, we thought it was kind of good cause we were, we're new and we knew that, uh, getting information or trying to get informants was the key to, you know, being a good cop, but we didn't really know how to do it because we're too new. So we talked to everybody and you kind of find out that uh, the drug dealer on one corner is ratting out the drug dealer on the other corner it's just so you can he can do his thing and you're oblivious to it and then the drug dealer down the street's doing the same thing to the first guy so you kind of learn off still being a community brand new officer but um in chatting people up and talking to people there's one guy also named mark in the village and uh you know he's one of these klingons you know he sees the cops in uniform walking around follows you around talks to you a lot asks a bunch of questions yeah um and you just, you just, you know, grin and bear, put your smile on and, you know, and, and uh, you know, be friendly to them, as we're supposed to do. And so one day Todd and I walk in uh, the village there and uh, Mark's in his little, very small front yard and he's, uh, he's almost in tears. And um, I said, you know, you know, dude, what's up? And uh, he goes, well, it's the anniversary of my, my daughter's death. She died as a child from an accident. Mm. And, um, you know, so we try to console him and talk to him a little bit. And... Uh, um, credit to my, my, my friend Todd, because uh, later on we went to uh, take a lunch break and um, at a convenience store we're getting a sandwich, there's uh, some condolence cards. And he said, how about we get a condolence card for Mark? That's a good idea. Nice. And uh, so we got a condolence card. We, you know, we both signed it. And later on the next that, that day or next day we see him and go, hey, just, just know we, we are thinking of you. We feel bad for you. And, you know, here's a card. Um, that guy's face lit up. He's like, holy shit, somebody cares. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a down out neighborhood. He's a down out kind of guy. And, uh, um, he's like, holy shit, you know, somebody actually he cares. And, uh, again, mo most credit goes to my, my partner, Todd, cause he's the one who thought of it, but it, it's, it turned this guy's day around and took him out of the dumps. And, uh, that's great. It's like, you know, some nice little things, you, little things you do and you can kind of forget because I grew up in a middle-class family, both parents and all my you know the guard rules were up so the the morals and the values and work ethic were all there but when you're a police officer you're rolling into people's houses and neighborhoods where those guard rules aren't up yeah and uh, you kind of forget that that uh you know people do grow up different than you and how and sure and you're you're just a you know a flash in the pan you just drive by and wave or you talk to them so you make an impact for a day and that was uh again um my partner todd did uh initiate on that and that's uh you know made this guy's day on a bad day made it better that's awesome. I love that. That's cool. Um, Mark, one of the most popular uh, questions I ask is this one. It's about advice for new police officers or police candidates. We have a lot of listeners that are um, younger. They're just getting into it, and they're thirsty for knowledge about the profession. So a guy like you uh, who could impart some wisdom would be very valuable to them. Uh, no pressure. 
Yeah, no pressure. Um, <laughs> no, like I said, if you're, if you're, if you, you got to want to talk to people. You got to want to try and help them out because you got to do the same thing over and over again. It's kind of wear you down, and you got to have fun. Um, like we said earlier, you got to handle some difficult things. If 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 you don't think you can handle it, um, you may want to try to do something different. But if you, if you think you can handle it, you want to handle it, and you like talking to people. Uh, you like working the street. If you're detail oriented, um, uh, you know, it's all there. there. You can do, it, it fits almost any personality, but you have to be able to, you have to communicate well with, uh, with anybody from any so, social status. I mean, if it's a wealthy person or a down and out or a person under the bridge, you got to relate to them. And I didn't know any of that when I first started. Uh, I had some great, uh, I'll throw some names out there if you're listening, but you know, Bruce Nees, Fran Malazzi. Uh, Leroy Bidwell. These were all veteran cops, and um, I was fortunate enough that they, at times, took me under the wing and said, "It's a better way to do it than you are, Mark. You know, talk to them, sit down, take your time, and uh, and really get to know their side of the coin." And that's uh, a great thing. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to take your time, um, and know that when you walk in there, as uh, as any veteran does, you know the the evening shift, midnight shift, weekend shift is fun at first, but when you start having families. Um, it's a stressor yeah. and you don't know how much a stress is going to be until you get into it. So, you know, no, that's down the road. Um, and to any cop that's out there, even if they've been around for a while, um, get, get some rank, get some experience, uh, any profession, um, get training, you know, how much work you do on the street or as an investigator, always get more training because that makes you more promotable. It makes you a better officer, detective or sergeant. Um, and I don't know, just, you know, if you want to do it, do it. I mean, they're, they're, they're screaming for people. When I applied for the job, uh, almost 30 years ago, it was, you know, 400 people for 10 spots. Now they can't fill 10 spots to get, you know, three people applying Yeah. and the quality is sometimes is questionable. So if you, if you want to do it, you know, and you're, you think you got it then then go for it. I mean, it's, it's rewarding. Um, if you're from the Northeast, uh, conversation is pretty good. I know down, uh, down South and some of the rural areas of the country, it's not, but right. uh, the Northeast, you can do a, a pretty good job, make a pretty good living out of it. Let me ask you a question for myself, Mark. Um, yeah. get it personal here, get some personal advice from you when I got you on the line. Um, so I'm a guy that's been in law enforcement for probably about 14 years now. Um, took a little break in between, um, all my friends and peers now are sergeants or detectives or lieutenants or whatever. I'm, I'm back in patrol, but I never applied to be a sergeant or anything like that. I always kind of like being a patrol, just get in your car with your duty bag and it's just you, you know, you didn't yeah. not, not have to worry about much, but you know, I'm 41 now and, um, the supervisor idea has been thrown at me before, you know, recently, like, Hey, would, would you be interested type of thing? Um, What's good advice for a guy leaving patrol going to like sergeant? Um, or just what comes to your mind advice, like well, right away? What comes to mind? Like anybody else, there, there, there are two kinds of uh, supervisors. Those who get involved and know what's going on and those who fill out the sheets and don't want to know. Um, <laughs> general speaking, that was kind of, kind of what you had going. Right. And then... When I was a new sergeant going to classes that we were required to take, you know, they go around the room, you know, how you like being a new sergeant? And they go, most guys, like, all they do is fill out the overtime book, make phone calls, fill the overtime book, you know, taking uh, the private job uh, calls. And um, so it's not the, how you say, you're a patrolman, you're hopping your cruiser, you got your duty bag, um, and you're your own boss. And you can, you know, go out there and, uh, you know, meet and greet people, or if you're not feeling good, just, you know, sit back and do words with friends and wait for the end of the shift, and you you can kind of do your own thing. Right. Once you're a boss, other people's problems become your problems, um, you know, on-the-job problem, not the personal ones. And so, uh, you know, how do I investigate this? How do I investigate that? Should just, you know, should we do this? Um, should we not do that? And uh, so, you know, you're part motivator, you're part psychologist, you're part parent, um, all those things come into play. And uh, you're gonna be the bad guy sooner or later. Um, yeah. Everybody that became a new a new sergeant after me, I gave him advice and said, "You're gonna discover that some of the officers you work with 
are superstars and never get credit for it. And the ones you think are superstars are, have been sandbagging all the way along. Because huh. you read all the reports, you see the investigations, you sign off on all the warrants, and it's like, wow, this, this guy or gal is, is really rocking it. And, yeah. and they're under the radar and just like doing their thing. Meanwhile, somebody else is always like, you know, a cheerleader. And then you read the report with the warrant and you're going, um, I'm not quite sure you got probable cause here. You might want to go back and reinvestigate this or do some more interviews. <laughs> right. So it, it's uh, so you, you get the, the you get to really see um, some of that. But um, one of my favorite cops, he's a super aggressive, super smart guy, uh, one of the best officers I've ever worked with, patrol wise. And um, I was saying you should become a sergeant because I think you can uh, you know train up a, a squad to uh, you know your your work ethic and your experiences. Mm -hmm. And he took the test, he passed, he made guys stripes, and then uh, six months later, turned back in and goes, I don't want to be responsible for the people. I mean, I said, you know, the, the parent part, you hear the complaining, you know, why has he got this call and I don't get this call? You know, I should get this case. You know, why do, why do I have to go back and, and read these people? It's like, well, you know, you become the taskmaster. It's like, hey, this is because you want to do a quality case here, right? Yes. Then you have to go out and re-interview these people and get some <laughs> right. better statements. You, the, uh, the, 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 the court's not going to like this. You know, yeah, you yeah, yeah. go out there and, and do it. So, again, you know, you become a taskmaster to parent. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, I found it rewarding when um, at one time my squad, me and other uh, Sergeant uh, Don were pretty much running the show on evenings. And I go through stats once in a while and uh, for um, – on-site arrests, uh, closed investigations, closed warrants, and closed cases by arrest. Um, we, we were leading all the other squads. Nice. And, you know, we had, you know, you know, three different shifts, and each shift is split into two different squads. So six squads were leading all, you know, six squads were doing it. And I like to think is because, you know, Don and I was like, you know, go out there and do your thing. We want you to work hard. If you have a question, call us. We'll show up. It's one of those legal things. We're kind of stretching the balance of the Constitution. Uh, well, we're there, and if something snaps in our face, then our name's on it. We were there, and we'll take the fall for it, not you, because we're the, we got the stripes and you followed our rules. So, right. Um, once they trusted it, we would get, we would take the heat for anything going on, whether it was, you know, best some general wars rules or, uh, or whatever. It's like, well, you know, and they went out and they, and they loved it. It's like, let's, let's go out there. And again, it's not completely correct. And I'm sure who's going to, you know, hear your, your podcast here, but, um, you know, Don, and I would say, okay, let's, Get a car chase, a foot chase, and a dog bite. Let's go out, you know, right. shake the trees, find some criminals. Sure. And, and Do some they police work. That. And that's, you know, it's, it, it's an evening shift, and they were uh, mostly younger officers, and that's what they wanted to do. Um, other shifts are like, yeah, what can I can I get through the next nine hours without having to do much? It's like, yeah, it's, it's a long day for not doing much, you know? Yeah. So, but it is a big thing. You got you got to. Uh, I know some detectives that took sergeant, and they said, you know, as a detective again, you you run your own show for the most part, and then as a sergeant, you're like you're you're babysitting other people, trying to get them to run their own show. And it's the old the old adage, you know, ten percent of the ten uh, percent of your workers occupy nine percent of your time because they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. You know? <laughs> right. It's always the same. It's always yeah. the same guy or gal that's making a mistake. You're always like. I told you a hundred times not to do that. You know, you right. don't interview a juvenile without the parent there. And so this warrant's invalid. Go back and do it again. You know, so it's, you know, those things there, whereas the other 90% of the squad are doing a thing just fine without really any need you to be there. But, um, it's so funny. that gets frustrating. Just dealing, just dealing with coworkers who don't, uh, don't want to step up. Isn't it funny working with people? Anywhere. Like for me, whenever I, <clears throat> if I was ever corrected by a supervisor, I always found it like embarrassing. And I was always like, Ugh, I'm never doing that again. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm doing right. it that way. And then to see someone to keep doing it, like they just, it's like, it's almost like you almost admire them. You're like, wow, you just, you don't care. Do you? <laughs> it's like either you don't yeah, care no. or you really just don't remember. I like to me, that was always so bizarre. Yeah. And, that, and that's the frustrating part of being a sergeant, a range supervisor is you, you do, you do deal with people who don't care. I yeah. Mean, police force, like any other job, you're going to have that, you know, in the Marine Corps, we call you know, the 10% shipbirds. But those people, they just don't care. They don't want to be yeah. there. They don't want to do anything. They're in the not union. That, You're that not going to touch them. But, we're co but, but yeah, the, the union, and, yeah, the union has their own set of rules. It doesn't uh, dovetail with the, the PD sometimes. So, um, you know, it's – so as a sergeant, you're dealing more with that stuff. But yeah. um, if, you, if, if, if you have a good uh, 
in our PD, you know, it was patrolman, sergeant, lieutenant, lieutenant ran the whole show for a squad. If, if you have a good lieutenant on top of you that backs you up unless you kind of run your own thing and um, answers questions that you need without, you know, being wishy-washy. Um, I thought being a sergeant was, at first it was kind of a drag. Um, it was evening shift, weekends, uh, working with some people who didn't want to be there. But um, the last uh, three or four years I was on was a patrol sergeant and um, loved it. That they were at a, at a great squad, uh, a great boss, and uh, you know, kind of went out on top. And uh, that that was that was the most fun part. Besides doing our cogs work, that was the most fun. But the last three or four years with my squad was uh, phenomenal. So my dad said he was he was like senior sergeant for years, like first sergeant, and then he became lieutenant, and he was like hated it he did it for like three years yeah, yeah. at the end of his career and he's like man he's like that sergeant's job was so sweet and then i took the stupid yeah. lieutenant's job and it was like you know all of a sudden he's out of the union fighting everybody all the time he's like i just this job sucks yeah and again i know you're a pd your dad's pd but when he's gonna be lieutenant then it's like well yeah you're you know you become the heavy you know if you, yeah they rotate him through ia and it's like yep. uh, you know some guys have to be disciplined heavily some guys gotta be fired Yep. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's an extra chunk of change in your pocket, but um, sometimes the uh, <laughs> that benefit's not worth it. Yep. But, uh, again, I liked I did I did my whole career working the, the street or investigations. Um, I didn't do too much inside work, so that, that was it's where I wanted to be. And uh, again, I was your age when I made sergeant, and it's kind of good because as you, you you age out of this job, I mean you're not gonna be 55, 60 years old chasing people down. Right. Um, if you, you like working the street, uh, so being a sergeant is kind of easy way. It's a little, a little less of the the grunt work. Um, so, you know, I for me, you know, worked out well. I had about uh, 10, 11 years on when I got my stripes and I finished up in the last ten years. I love it, Mark Andrew Kelly. Awesome interview, man. Thank you so much. Front row seat. Uh, I can already tell. Um, probably, probably such a fun read. I can't wait to read it myself. Can you tell everybody um, best place to get it? Uh, best place to get it is uh, Amazon, of course, uh, Barnes and Noble, Indie Bound, and Books a Million. Excellent. I will um, in the show notes. I'll link that, and I'll link it on our website, and I'll link it also um, on the Facebook page, and um, so everybody can get it. And do you have um, social media that you're you're putting out there? Uh, I am on Facebook under my full name, Mark Andrew Kelly, uh, and also there's a website, uh, acopstory.com. Uh, so awesome. You, uh, leave comments uh, either way on Facebook or uh, the website. It's uh, a good way to reach me. Perfect. Thank you for coming on, sir. Hey, thank you, Steve. Good talk. Be safe. All right. I'll talk to you. Hang on the line for one sec. I'll, I'm going to end the recording. Sure. Hey guys, thank you for listening to episode number 77 with Mark Andrew Kelly. Awesome interview. I had a lot of fun. Um, East Hartford, Connecticut, man. Crazy place. Hartford in general is uh, is like the Wild West. People don't know that, but Connecticut, pretty rough streets there. <laughs> we had a guy transfer from Cape Cod to Hartford. Um Six months was in a huge shootout. So uh, it's a crazy place. Mark had some great stories. His book sounds awesome. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for rating, reviewing. You guys have really come out. I got over 500 reviews now. That's really helping with whatever algorithm that um, iTunes uses. So please keep rating, reviewing. I'm still um, getting enough reviews now that once in a while I do get like a terrible one star review and people say nasty things. And that's just. That's just the way it is. Um, if you're if you're running uh, any kind of conservative podcast or police positive podcast, um, that's how you know when you're getting a lot of eyes is when people start hating it. So um, the best thing you could do for the show uh, is just to go on and give it a five star review and um, write a little review saying you like it. I really appreciate that. Um, and go to thingspolicey.com. If you, if you really love the show and appreciate the contact that you can uh, donate to the podcast there. And also if you want to be a guest, always looking for guests, guys, thingspolicey.com. Um, you can scroll down, click on, be a guest, quick synopsis. I don't need a lot. Just, you know, was a cop this many years, uh, 
have these specialties, you can just put like bad car crash, suicide, um, crazy turkey, I, whatever, <laughs> whatever you have, you know, just give me a, a little bit and I'll get it in my email and I'll have you come on. I, and I can't stress enough that this podcast has 77 interviews now and I have everything from rural police to big city and people love all of it. People love to hear a police officer talk about their work. It's all fascinating and everybody has stories. So um, don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Submit to the show if you're a police officer and you feel like you want to come on and and tell some stories. Okay. Um, Thank you again. And I'll see you guys next time.